So I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, the Excellus Remy robotic system. This is this is a new robot, and you know technology evolves, and and we'll uh, we'll look at this and uh, go through some of the pros and cons. So this, these are my disclosures. I'm a co-founder of a company called Fusion Robotics. In June of 21, Fusion Robotics merged with another company called Integrity Implants to form Excellus, and I own stock in Excellus, and I'm the chief robotics officer. So I've got some conflicts. This is the classic adoption curve for new technology. Uh, you're all familiar with this, no doubt. And Spinal Robotics uh, remains in the early phases of this adoption curve. So what do we need going forward, uh, at least from my point of view, to move spinal robotics further along this curve? Well, the systems need to be easier to use. They need to have more favorable economics, especially if we're going to move them into the ASC environment, which I think is essential. It's one of my goals. They need to be simple, efficient, and practical. We've heard about workflow a lot this morning, and that, that's, that's a critical issue with robots. Anyone who uses a robot, especially as they begin their journey, will tell you that initially these, these lengthen your workflow. So anything we can do to make that workflow more efficient is, is going to be helpful in terms of not only your practice, but the overall adoption of robotic technology and spine surgery. And all these things should lead to increased clinical value. So my point of view, uh, one of the reasons I got involved in developing a, a different robotic system is that I believe the current spine robots, is, as good as they are, are too big, too complex, and too expensive. And so uh, the Remy robot is simple, it's compact, and, and it's quite economical. The uh, robot is designed to make the workflow more efficient. It's optimized for daily use, and it's cost-effective without compromise. It'll accomplish anything the other robots will do at about a quarter to a third of their price. The workflow is integrated with the software. The software is surgeon-centric, and the system intelligence anticipates your next move. So this actually moves along pretty quickly. We've got uh, the, the robot over next door uh, in the demo room, and, and those of you who are interested can look at this thing uh, in, in a bit. So here's, here's an overview of how it works. Uh, so patient, this is a typical posterior fusion patient, use a Jackson frame, I fix the patient to the table, and then the robot and the camera are both mounted to the table, both very lightweight. I put the robot up above me, but on the side I'm standing, put the camera on the other side, but it looks right up the midline of the patient. And uh, for regulatory purposes, the camera mounts uh, to uh, an iliac fixation pin. I don't use that, but that's an off-label use right now. Um, 3D navigation here with, with the O-arm, pretty standard, and a registration array. The, once those uh, images have been uh, collected, they're ported in, over to the, uh, the, the computer and the system, and that cart is an empty cart to hold things. Uh, the computer is, a, is an all-in-one touch screen, as you see there. So you move the, the robot, you, the surgeon, over near your target, and the system tells you when you're close, and then the robot will navigate to the, uh, the final planned trajectory with the push of a button. I typically have the rep uh, or, or one of the fellows push the button. You can mount that control unit if you want on the operating table. I don't like to clutter my field. I like to keep things out of the way. And then the rest of the navigation is pretty standard, just like you've, you've seen this morning with the other systems. So it just gets you there very quickly. So we went through lots of uh, work, uh, not only developing the system, but proving that it's accurate. And I can tell you we've got submillimetric accuracy here uh, compared to ground truth. And that's actually greater accuracy than FDA requires. And there, <clears throat> there are some reasons the system is, is so accurate. The camera stays in the field uh, throughout the procedure. You can leave it there even after you've finished using the robot. Interesting camera that uh, has a fisheye view of uh, the surgical field, so tremendous field of view. 
The other thing I like about that camera, and I, as Pat said, I've been navigating a long time. I'm, I'm the fellow who developed the stealth spine uh, application back in 91, 92, you know, just, just before Pat was a fellow, or just as he became a fellow. And so I've done navigation for years and years and years. And you know, the typical cameras are a standoff from your field. Well, invariably someone gets in the way of one of those cameras and you gotta duck and, and move. Uh, here you can crowd around the field because the camera is typically located at mid-thigh level or knee uh, uh, flexion crease level uh, just below you. And uh, I, I find that uh, not having to, to deal with, with line of sight issues is, is just uh, improves my workflow and a, a less, less of an irritant. The navigation is very stable. Um, look at the screen as I'm moving the array and try that with any other navigation system. What you'll see is you'll watch the trajectory bounce. I just saw it on the previous demonstration. Uh, if you looked at the accuracy there, the, the system was off by several millimeters and that's no criticism. They're all like that. I call it virtual facade. You get a pretty picture, but it's actually not the truth, okay? So again, uh, the, 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 we've, we've intentionally engineered it this way. Okay, so what do I do? Uh, I don't use a DRA. This, this is in lumbar applications. I fix the patient to the table with some fixation tape that was actually, it's, it's micro Velcro uh, that was developed for OBGYN surgeons. You can use it to move things out of the way. But you can firmly fix a, and safely fix a patient to the table. And then I attach the small robot and the camera to the table. This is, you can do this in minutes. And, and, and I'm ready to spin. So I've played with doing the spin with the patient already sterile and draped, not sterile and draped. I prefer to do the spin without the patient having been prepped and draped. It's so easy to use the drape sleeves on the robot and camera. And just in case you have to readjust your registration array, you know, it's not quite in the right place. If things are prepped and draped, it's kind of a pain to get in there. That Someone mentioned before the arm is a little bit of a monster, and it is. Uh, but if you can get in there and not worry about sterility at that time, at least for me and my workflow, it, it, it's easier. And so images are, you know, this is standard stuff, ported automatically over to the, 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 uh, the, the all-in-one computer that's the computer for the system. The planning here is intentionally very simple. It's, it's click and drag. So you, you plan, plan your screws. And I'll, I'll typically, so I have them get the OR spin while I'm out scrubbing. And then, and then I'll come in, they've got the spin. I, I, I quickly plan and then, uh, and then uh, go over to the, the surgical field. So there's a, a ratchet mechanism that lets you fix the robot in, in reach of your target, and the system will tell you when you're in reach. And typically, for two adjacent pedicles, uh, you can put the robot in a single position and get to both of those pedicles. So here, for example, I'm doing an L5-S1 case. The system tells me, hey, you're in reach for L5 and S1. And uh, then you uh, drive the robot to its position and uh, affect your, uh, your pilot hole and place, place your screws. Uh, standard, standard navigation that we've done for years and years. Just, just very accurate, very fast. The, uh, and you can, I use an awl. I've used an awl for years and years. You can use a drill if you wish. It's kind of dealer's choice. One of the things I like about the robot is there, you, you can overcome it if you, do, if you will. Remember, all these robots are trajectory guides. And so you can argue over whether or not you want a rigid trajectory guide or one that will yield to you a little bit. I like it to yield a little bit because I will, if I see, because as I'm advancing my all or, or any track tool, I can watch it live, real time. And if I think, if I see that I'm skiving, I'll actually slightly adjust the trajectory. Uh, to overcome that skive, yeah, and I like that, rather than being constrained to a plan that may be going off target. I, I of course, want to real-time correct that. And then the screw goes in. It, again, standard stuff. These are line cider screws, perk screws. Perk screws have been around for a while. This is a, a relatively straightforward case, patient with vertical foraminal stenosis who had a 
degenerative scoliosis, and as you often see, uh, you know, the, 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 the scoliosis was asymptomatic. Which what was what was symptomatic here was an isolated L5 radiculopathy with a foot drop, because of the collapse, the asymmetric collapse of that foramen at L5 S1 on one side, and uh, there's a placement of four screws and a minimally invasive T-lift to correct that. So we've looked at trying to quantify what we think is a very efficient system. This is an article that was published in Curious this summer. I've got the reference on the next slide. John Polina from the University of Buffalo was the lead author, and John's very, very experienced uh, with the Mazora X system. He's done hundreds of cases. So we concocted a study. He, he has been interested in workflow and actually times every step of his operations. So we had an independent observer time John placing four screws with uh, the Mosor X system and four screws um, with uh, the, the, the Remy system, then the fusion robotic system, and uh, at, at time both, and also then get post scans and look at accuracy. So what we found was that both systems were accurate. Uh, that wasn't an issue, but the, the Remy system was far uh, more efficient so just to quantify that a little bit, um, you can see that from setting up the robot to having those four screws in position was a little over half an hour with the Remy. And in very experienced hands, it was almost an hour with the Mazor. So needless to say, that was quite statistically significant. And keep in mind, this was his first time ever seeing or using this thing, whereas he had, you know, several hundred cases under his belt with the Mazor. It's, it's just faster. Fixing everything to the table has advantages. You know, the navigation, as we talked about earlier, it's a wonderful thing, but you, you can be beguiled by an image and forget about the sources of inaccuracy. Uh, when you have a camera standing off the, away from the patient, um, there's this phenomenon called the silent loss of navigational accuracy. I don't know if you guys have ever read any of those papers, but, but it turns out that even though we dynamically reference, and you know, we defined dynamically reference, dynamic referencing as stealth you know, back in 1990, late 80s. So yeah, it's great, mathematics look good on paper, but those little reflective spheres that you use, they're not quite spherical. There are slight irregularities there. And so if you move the patient vis-a-vis -vis that camera, or you move the camera vis-a-vis -vis the patient, the incident angle of the light that's reflected off those cameras changes. And you can watch, if you're in the lab, you can watch your image bounce with a standard camera. That's one of the reasons why when you move that array, do it for yourselves. You'll see your image go from one, one place to another. So what's real? Is the real image where it's showing you in the pedicle or is the real image where it's showing you outside of the pedicle? And I do think some of the navigational problems, you know, Juan Uribe just posted that case recently on LinkedIn of the misnavigated robotic screw. Some of that is probably scything. Some of that is system trouble with, with, with standard navigation. So this is a, a simple, efficient, uh, and, and, and importantly, economic system. Now, the, the biggest hassle factor for me is getting the 3D image. So I'm, I'm a big fan of navigated floral. I, uh, the, this part of the team that's involved here was part of the team that worked with me back in the early 2000s to develop the original FloroNav system. And so we've currently got the 3D imaging system going. Again, you can see it next door. I can tell you the 2D, multiplanar 2D imaging system works. That's what I'm gonna take to my surgery center. We don't have 3D imaging in my surgery center. You could buy it, but personally, we won't buy anything over a certain threshold in our surgery center. We own it. We're not gonna spend that money. So I want this to work with the OEC I already own, and it will, because I want to do this in the surgery center. We do outpatient T-lifts all the time in the surgery center. I just, I just don't want to get irradiated anymore. There's a motorized lock to that robotic arm coming. It exists now. It should be ready for general use in the in first quarter of next year. We will show FDA that we don't need dynamic referencing with this system. Uh, and right now, that's off-label use. It's how I do it. It's on-label requires that pin connected to the camera. 
You can do single position procedures with this right now, but there's not very much to get in your way. You can do cervical procedures, inner body navigation is coming. Um, this is a, a little teaser of what we're doing with the, the, the Fluoro software. And you know, many of you, I'm sure, have Fluoro navigated screws with C arm for years and years with AP and lateral. If you want to get a, a, an owl's eye view, you can do that too. But once you've collected those views with you standing back so you're not irradiated, you can then navigate off, off of all of those views quite accurately and, and even plan your rods. Is another interesting aspect of the system. This I took this picture of Brad Clayton, uh, who is one of the other co-founders of Fusion Robotics. We were demoing the system at Esmus last last fall. Uh, Esmus happened to be in Las Vegas. That's a picture of Brad in the Las Vegas airport. I said, "Hey, stop! I got to take a picture of this." That's the whole robot system and one half of his carry-on. This, you, as I said, you could use a laptop, a touchscreen laptop with this. So that's the camera, the robot, everything. And the other half of his suitcase were his clothes and toiletries for that weekend. <laughs> so that's the Excellus Remy spinal robotic system. And I thank you for your attention. Not quite, but getting close. <laughs> Kevin, thank you very much for an incredible talk. Um, I just want to know, uh, you know, where's it going to go from here? What's, what's your next vision? Because, you know, you're just such an innovator from the very, very, very beginning. I mean, where's it going to go? Yeah, so I, I mean, this is a phase, right? We're 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 in evolution. It, it's it's only going to get better. I know that. You know what that. They, uh, what, what's going on inside of your head? Well, you know, <laughs> a few things. You know, as as well, I those patents haven't been issued yet. <laughs> <laughs> I can disclose a few things. So just. Uh, no question that the workflow work you guys are doing is key. Um, collecting all that data. Uh, is going to help us improve what we do. Uh, navigating real time, real time, mm -hmm. is right. going to be key. You know, we, now we get an image and then we navigate off that image and things can go wrong. If you have a DRA, how, you know, people bump the DRA. Or as I talked about that silent loss of navigational accuracies, someone moves the camera. In a cranial case, all you have to do is raise the head of the bed. You know, little brain swelling, get, you know, we're, we're brain surgeons too. Let's get the head of the bed up to reduce the brain swelling. Well, you just threw your system off and most of you aren't aware that that happens. Uh, it, it's striking, you can lose several millimeters of accuracy in, in the OR, it's L5-S1, you say, oh, I want a little bit more reverse Trendelenburg so my back isn't cranked into that weird position. You just lost some accuracy. We, we, the dynamic referencing doesn't compensate for all that. Well, there, there are technologies on the way using ultrasound for instantaneous registration, using light field registration, which we're going to hear about uh, later, uh, using instanta near instantaneous imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, to to quickly update your navigation solution. So there, there are some cool things coming. That's great. Well, you, you've heard it from an incredible luminary, and thank you very much, Kevin. So, Danielle, we're in time for a break. Is that?